Um, it just kind of reminded me, how many of you have uh, been on Facebook and you've seen, post this and you'll be blessed, and do this, you'll be blessed, do that and the other and you'll be blessed, the Lord will bless you. The thing is, how can he bless me anymore? I'm already blessed. And you know, that's, that's probably one of our, one of the things we're trying to do is earn God's love. We want him to love us more, so we want to be good little boys and girls and love us more. He's already loved us. We cannot be loved anymore. Um, we're already loved. I love that song. Um, as you know, Glenn's out tonight. Continue to pray for him. He said he was still feeling very ill. And uh, this afternoon, after I got up from my nap, <laughs> I said, oh, i got to get something together here. And, um, and I was bouncing back and forth between two books. I was almost put it up for a hand raise tonight, but <coughs> I really don't think that's what the Lord wants me to do. <coughs> but there's two books, two books I haven't taught from in many, many years. One is Haggai, and I was going to go ahead and teach the entire book of Haggai, or there's the first chapter of James. Uh, you've heard me quote James many times, but I've never actually, well, let me take that back. I've taught through it one time in the past 14 years. But so that was my option. So well, I can do both chapters of Haggai, or I can do one chapter of James. And I mean, that's a good chapter, and it's a you know one single chapter that you can teach and get you know expounded on and glean from. And uh, it wasn't until the first song, and uh, it's like because I'm afraid you know and. James chapter 1, verse 2, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and he'll give to all, to all generously without reproach. And my prayer this morning, said, or before I got up here, or before the worship service actually started, is which one do you want me to teach? And the song said it all. It's like, there we go. It's a perfect song. So, if you're still guessing, <laughs> we're in James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Um, and this is kind of where I'm at right now. Um, we're in, in Calvary Cafe. We're going through spirit, soul, and body. And James breaks it down here, you know. You've got the spirit, and you've got the, and you've got the, and the, the flesh. And uh, if you lack wisdom, you know, just turn to God. He'll, he'll direct you. And so that's basically uh, where I'm at right now. And so I thought this would be the perfect book for tonight. And so, James chapter 1, you know what, let's just read the whole chapter. I think it's a good, I like reading it. I actually have this chapter memorized, even though, I, like I said, I only taught from it one year, or once in, one year out of 14. It says, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Oh, I love that. You, <laughs> you're going, the, the outcome is for us to, to lack in nothing. But if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded and unstable in all of his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. Because like flowering grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and his flower falls off, and the beauty of his appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he has been tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And once sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of a first fruit among his creatures. 
This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness, all that remains of wickedness, in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. But prove yourselves doers of the word, not just merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks in his, at his natural face in a mirror. And for once he's looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law, this is the law of liberty, <laughs> the law of liberty and abides by it. Not having become a forgetful here, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in what he does. <laughs> if anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but, uh, I'm sorry, verse how did I get through there? Oh, okay. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distresses and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just ask for your wisdom tonight to lead us and guide us to your truth. Help us to understand Help us to hear, help us to receive and apply your word so that we can be effectual doers of your word. Lord, it's our desire to bless you because you have blessed us so abundantly. And uh, again, we just ask for your spirit and uh, your word promises that if we ask without any doubting, um, you'll, you'll uh, give us that wisdom that we ask. All right, James, a bondservant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. James is uh, the brother of Jesus, but we notice that he does not stake that claim, <laughs> you know, because that's of the flesh. He was of the, that's of the flesh. What he thinks more, is more important is that Jesus is his savior. And he says, I'm a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a willing servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what uh, John tells us in the book of Revelation? That God gives revelation to his bond servants. Do you receive revelation? You know, do, do you consider your, you know, a slave by choice? That is, you know, when you choose to be a slave, it's no longer about what you want, what you desire, what you think is right, what you think is wrong. You know, what you think is going to happen. It's, a, it's about submitting to God. So when we, you know, it, you know, this is, might be something you, you know, God wants us coming to him with our petitions. But, you know, that's when we have petition. What we should be doing in prayer, turning to God and say, God, reporting to duty. What is your will for me to do today? How would you, what would you have me to do? That should be our attitude in prayer. You know, and, and you know. In our attitude of prayer, of having, you know, this is my Lord, this is my Savior, sometimes a need will come about. Sometimes understanding will, you know, come about. And so we turn to Him in prayer for those things. But this should not be our attitude to treat Him as some sort of Buddha that you're going to rub His belly or, you know, a genie in a bottle that, you know, He's going to pop out and grant me all my wishes. That's, that's not our God. That's not who He is. James says, I'm a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he staked no claim to the fact that he, you know, he was a half-brother of Jesus. You know, he didn't stake the claim of, of who he was in the flesh. He wanted people to know who he is serving as he wrote this letter. I'm a bond servant of the Lord. I'm serving him. To the 12 tribes who were dispersed abroad. There was, of course, this is after, you know, uh, the Jews had begun to, uh, when persecution had come down, uh, the Jews began to scatter. But of course, there's the church that was in the midst of this 12 tribes. And John, or James's ministry was to the Jew. And so he's, uh, the, he, he remained in Jerusalem. They were dispersed. So these are his people that, that had scattered. And, in the, and apparently they had written him letters. You know, there was some fighting, there was some quarreling, there was some backbiting that was going on here. You know, people were 
upset. People were scared. And keep in mind, as they're scattered, most of them had lost everything they owned. So they're totally relying on the Lord here. But because they lost everything they've owned, I'm sure there's worry. I'm sure there's doubts. I'm sure there's fear. And so, you know, contention had arise. You know, they're backbiting. They're fighting. They're quarreling. And so James is addressing all this. He says, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. Consider it all joy. You're being persecuted. You've lost everything. There is contention within. He says, consider it joy. It's joy. Now, he's not saying jump up and down and, you know, and, and, and have a great time in the midst of persecution. He's saying, consider it joy. It's about joy. The end result is going to be joy. Because God loves you. He cares for you. He's working these things out. You remember we talked about this morning. We were talking about, you know, forgiveness is not everything. It's the starting point. We're in the process of redemption. We're being redeemed. We're redeemed. God has purchased us, but we're being taken out of the world. You know, sometimes we're white-knuckling the things of this world. We don't want to let go. And so we're in the process of that. And sometimes to get us to let go... God's going to pry our fingers up sometimes. He's going, to, he's going to, you know, create some friction. And so he says, consider that joy. God loves you. And the end result is going to be joy. He says, consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, this is not the kind of test you sit down, right, you know, and I'm marking A, B, C, or, you know, it's a multiple choice, or, or maybe it's even, you know, a, a questionnaire. You're, you're, you're. He's not testing to see if you're going to pass or fail. That's not the kind of testing that God sends us through. You know, just like when you want to strengthen metal, what do you do? You put it in the fire. You heat it up until it's cherry red, right? And then you put it in water and chill it off. That's the kind of testing that we're talking about, the test that strengthens. That in, you know, just like when you go to a gym, right? And you're, you're, you're exercising. We're talking about an exercise of faith here. You go to the gym, you're lifting these, this really heavy weight, and you're doing these curls. And, and what happens when you're trying to build up? You tear the muscle. The muscle tears. You actually tear the muscle. But when it heals, it's bigger and then it's stronger. That's what God is doing in our lives. You know, Abraham was put to the test. Take your son, your one and only son, up to the mountain to, to sacrifice him. God was testing Abraham. And Abraham passed the test, if you will. That is, his faith was strong. He took his son and he did exactly that. But there were many other tests before this great test. There's no way I could sacrifice my son. Because I'd be questioning myself. Am I truly hearing from God here? But, and Abraham knew that he was hearing from God. And he knew that he, God had told him to sacrifice his son. But his faith at this point was so strong. He says, well... All the promises that God promised to me flows through Isaac. I suppose he's just going to raise him from the dead. See, he knew that God was going to fulfill all of his promises. But he had been through many different tests along the way. And, and you know, there's many crises in Abraham's life. You know, just like he promised him a son. And Abraham is like waiting. He's looking at his, you know, his sundial. And he's like, man, God, it's been 25 years. Where's that son you promised me? And so, he, you know, in his frustration, he said, well, maybe God wants me to, you know, well, actually, it was Sarah who suggested this. And he said, you know, God's been told you you're going to have a son. I'm very old here. You're pretty old yourself. And he, she, he said, take, she said, take my handmaiden, Hagar, and have relations with her. And that, that child that comes from Hagar, that will be our son. You see, they got impatient. In this testing, in this strengthening of their faith, they get impatient and they try to help God out, you see. And then they end up with a little Ishmael. 
You know, and that proved to be disastrous even to this day, Ishmael. And we've all got a bunch of little Ishmaels running around, right? Because our faith, we had a faith in God and what he said, but well, maybe God wants me to help him out. And so we've got the little Ishmaels running around. But then there was many different tests such as that. You know, the very first thing that God said to Abraham, he says, leave this land of Ur and I'm going to show you a land that will be yours, a land that flows with milk and honey and it will be yours. Abraham had no idea where he was going. No idea. He was just to walk by faith. That was the first test. He just took one step at a time, and then God blessed him with all this territory. But anyway, this is consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter these various trials, knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. The more you're tested, the more you go under trial the more likely you will be to endure. And I'm telling you what, there's a lot to endure here soon. (laughs) We're going to, and our faith, this is when our faith really matters. When the trial, when the testing comes upon us, when when the hardship, when the persecution comes upon us, that's when faith really matters. But what do we often do? Well, I don't know about that. And we run off and do our fleshly thing, Right? Abra- or James is saying, you guys, you got to trust in God. He, he's working things out in your life personally. You're going through these trials. You're going through these tests. But the end result is going to be joy. But you got to stay with him. He strengthens your faith. When you remain faithful, your faith becomes greater. He says, knowing the t- uh, verse four, 4, let endurance have its perfect results so that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing god wants you to be completely and totally fulfilled but if anyone lacks wisdom let him ask of god who gives to all generously god is very generous with his wisdom he wants you to have wisdom he wants you coming to him and requesting of him what to do when to do it, what not to do, what, you know, where to do it, and without reproach. You know, sometimes we say, uh, this is a little thing. I really should not go to God over this little thing. It's not as if he's saying, you idiot, and slap you upside the head. He, he gives you wisdom without reproach. And it's, it's not like, you know, I go to him and ask him for some wisdom on a matter. It's like, Brian, you should know better by now. <laughs> you should know my heart. You should know my you know, what, I, what my will is. He doesn't do that. He's waiting there for you. He wants you coming to Him. He wants you requesting of Him wisdom. He says, And let endurance have its perfect result, so that you may be perfect and complete. But if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Verse 6, But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. Now, this really... Maybe he's he's like, wow, I doubt all the time. (laughs) The, The idea of doubt here is like, well, this is what God's Word says. This is what my doctor says, or this is what the politician says, or this is what the wise man of the world says. You know, it seems more wise to go with what uh, society says in this case. So I'm not going to do what God tells me to do. You know, that's the idea of doubting. We, you, we doubt. You know, we have questions. Is this really of God? Or is this really the right thing to do? You see, what we must do in those cases is go with what the Word of God says in spite of what our feelings and our thoughts are. You see, to doubt is to not do. That's the idea here. When you go to God, you ask Him for direction, and then He gives you that direction, and you say, well, I don't know about that, and you push it aside. That's the kind of doubt we're talking about here. And I see this a lot play out, even within the church body here. You know, um, uh, people put in a position, well, should I do this or should I do that? Well, this, we have this tendency to pick and choose God's wisdom when it suits us. And then when it doesn't suit us, then oftentimes we'll explain it away. So, well, you know, I've got a good explanation why I'm not doing that in this case. 
No, wisdom, going to God and asking wisdom. He gives you the wisdom. If you don't act upon it, listen to what he goes on to say. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is, uh, is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. In other words, if you do not act upon the wisdom that God gives to you, your life is going to be as about as stable as water. Of course, there's no stability with water. You're, you're just going to be tossing about, going this way, going that way. So, you know, for example, I'm trying to come up with an illustration that doesn't involve anyone here, so give me a moment. Um, All right, all right. Let's just take our last election, for example. And, I, and this is not, I'm not pointing to any one person, hear that. It's just an, a good illustration that I can use at this point. The last election, both presidents told us what they were going to do. One of them has, both of them actually had a track record, right? Right? But one was very offensive in his speech and what he said. You know, he has a good record here, but he's very offensive. You know, he, he shouldn't be president. And of course, the other one, everybody loved his speech. He was smooth talking. And each one of them told us exactly what they were going to do. And President Trump did exactly what he said he was going to do. And for the most part, President Biden has done exactly what he said he was going to do. But because it goes against my feelings, because the most, in my opinion, in my opinion, the most biblical principles was with President Trump. Although he was very arrogant, self-centered, very boastful, he had the most biblical platform. The other president, you, he, does, he wasn't very offensive. In fact, he was very soft-spoken and that his principles were very anti-biblical. So the choice is, which one do I choose? Well, I don't want to vote for President Trump. I don't like that guy, so I'm going to vote for this guy. That is going against God's wisdom, God's word. You see, I can vote for somebody I don't like based upon the principles and, and, and the promises. Now, if he doesn't Keep those promises, that's on him. But if I look at the other side and say, you know, I don't agree with this, but I like him, and he keeps those promises which were anti-biblical, that falls on me. That's on me, because I voted for that. So, wisdom. You have to put your feelings, your wants, your emotions aside. Yes, he's offensive. But I be believe in the platform. I agree with the platform. That's wisdom. That's the, God says, and you know, sometimes my feelings say, I don't want to do that because I don't like him. He says, if you're going to be like that, one moment going with what God's word says and the next moment going with what your feelings say, you're going to be as about as stable as water. If at one moment you say, well, I agree with what the Bible's, and we're getting off the presidential election here, but if for one moment the Bible says, this is what I need to do if I want to experience peace and joy, if I'm depressed, the Bible says, this is what I need to do. But <clears throat> on this side, the doctor says, I need to take a pill, I need to do this, that, or the other. You say, well, the Bible says this, the doctor says that, well, that's kind of old-fashioned what the Bible says. I'll go with what the doctor says about depression. God says, if you're going to be uh, adhering to my word one moment and going with what society says the next moment, what your feelings, what your emotions say the one moment, you'll be as stable as water. There will be no peace in your life. Right, constant state of confusion. And that's another thing, a good point, because that's another thing. If I'm not, if I'm going back and forth with the spirit and the flesh, then when, the, when a moment comes, a critical moment comes, how do I know that I'm hearing from the spirit? Right? 
Because it's going to become very confusing at that point. Was well, the Lord leading me here or is my flesh leading me here? You know? And so you, you, it's going to be harder to make decisions if you're not used to saying, rejecting your flesh and embracing the Spirit. Being a double-minded man, unstable in his ways, verse 8, verse 9. But the brother of humble circumstances is the glory in his high position. So, materially, you're poor. You have nothing. Society looks down their nose at you because of your humble circumstances. He says, well, you can glory because you have all the riches of Christ Jesus. You're blessed. And later on, well, I won't go there yet. And he goes on to say, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation. You want to glorify, you, you know, you want to give glory? Well, give glory in hu your humi humiliation. Be humble. Realize that, you know, he's not saying, he's not kicking the rich man to the curb. As he goes through this, he's not kicking the rich man to the curb. He's a, he's, he's a, James is going to the people where they are, where their minds are. He's saying the rich man is the humble in his hu hu humiliation. In other words, he's not rich because God has blessed him, uh, God has blessed him because he's such a great guy. No, he's to humble himself. I have what I have because God has been generous toward me. And he, so he's to humble in his, or glory in his humiliation. I'm not, I'm not any different than anyone else. And I give glory to God for all that I have. To glory in His humiliation. Now some people say, well, why does God allow this person to be rich and this guy to be poor? And the answer to that question is found in Acts chapter 17. God has created every circumstance, every event in our lives because He knows exactly what it will take to bring you to that point of making the decision. For some people, they, you know, just like Solomon, the richest man who ever lived, he realized in his riches that everything in this world is vain, that there's, he was still left empty. empty. For other people, it's getting to that place where they're wanting more and they can't obtain more, talking materially, so they have no other alternative but to turn to God. But God knows each one of our hearts. He knows what it takes to bring each of us to salvation. And a rich man is to glory in his humiliation. Realize, I have all this goods, all these goods. I give glory to God for showing me that. You see that? He's to glory in his humiliation. The, rich, the poor man is saying, you know, I have all these riches in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. And I thank God for where I'm at. Just like this, one of the songs said, you know, we, we've got to be content where the Lord has us. No matter where we're at, we've got to be content. Not wanting more. Paul says, I've learned to be content in my riches, you know, being filled, and I've learned to be content in my hunger, going without. Being content. Why? Because in that contentment, if, you, if you're at that place of contentment, then you realize that God is in control of all things. He's in control, and He's brought you here. And so we, we're to give glory to Him and to consider it all joy. Because the end result will be joy. Great, unspeakable joy. What verse did I leave off at? Okay. All right. For the, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation because like flowering grass, he will pass away. You know, he may look beautiful today, everything must, might look beautiful today, but it's all going to burn, it's all going to pass. And, and the rich man can give glory to God because although he's going to lose everything eventually on earth, he's going to obtain everything in heaven. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass and the flower falls off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life 
which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, once he's been approved, once God has worked these things out of his life, he will eventually receive the crown of life. That's the idea. God's working in us. He's working through us. He's sending us through trials. He's through and sending us through these testings because he wants us to receive the crown of life. That's the end result. So, bottom line is, we go to God for wisdom. We adhere to that wisdom no matter what it looks like, no matter what the circumstances are. And as, as we turn to him, as we receive his wisdom, as we act upon his wisdom, our faith grows and our, the peace in our hearts grow. As we look at the things of the world, what the rich man has, and say, you know what? That's nothing. It's all going to burn someday. My hope, my wants, my desires in heaven. Let no one say when he is being tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot tempt, be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Now, there's the, it's based upon context. The same word that's used for testing is, a, is the same word that's used for temptation or tempting. But a word has a different meaning depending upon its context. God tests us, but he doesn't tempt us. The testing is to bring about greater amount of faith, to build us up. A temptation is designed to bring us down, to destroy us. And uh, God does not. In other words, when God's throwing something at us, it's not to destroy us. It's not intended for evil. He doesn't tempt us, test us with evil. Now, Satan will throw evil at us and God will allow that so that this what Satan intends for evil, God will use for good. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Now, when we, the, the context of lust here is not necessarily a sexual kind of lust. It's wanting, desiring something of the flesh. You know, maybe you've listened to Calvary Cafe. You know, we're, we're, our tr we're a trinity. We're spirit, soul, and body, right? The soul is lodged in between the body and the spirit. The spirit can only relate to the things of God. The flesh, the body, can only relate to the things of the world. The body is constantly making demands. The flesh is constantly making demands. And we're so used to responding to the flesh. And that's one of the things that God's working out in our lives. Because most Christians live their lives upside down today. You know, they have the spirit, but they live in the flesh. Their souls are being dictated by the flesh. When Adam was in the garden, his spirit, the spirit of God was leading his soul. His soul was in charge and control of the flesh. But all that was flipped upside down when he died in spirit the flesh took control of the soul because the flesh the soul needs and wants satisfaction and fulfillment but the only thing we can relate to in the in the flesh or our souls can relate to is the body that's why god gives us his spirit so that we may have self-control you remember the fruit of the spirit the last of it all was self-control but the only way we can gain self-control is by being obedient to the Spirit over and over and over and over again. you got to be obedient to the Spirit. I can't tell you the number of times I've typed something I was going to post on Facebook, but the Spirit says, don't do that. And I take it down. And you practice that. You, may even, you might think it, but you'll never even type it out. Because you know that's not where the Spirit wants you to do, or where, where He wants you to go. But you've got to practice that. You've got to practice it every single day. It does, you know, it, it's in the little things. Jesus said, He who is faithful in the little things will be uh, trusted with the greater things. So if you want to be trusted with greater decisions, you're going to be faithful with the little decisions. Because if you're not faithful for the little decision, you won't be able to make the greater decision. That's why it's so important for you to start living in the, in the, in the, in the spirit. I started to say the, the spirit today, especially in our day. 
especially today, because the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, and He's coming quickly. This world is going to hell in a handbasket. And you want to make good decisions when it's easy so you can make the bigger decision when it gets harder. And it's going to get harder. When the economy crashes, when the food supply is com cut com nearly completely off, when, when, when the electricity goes off, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be tempted to say, well, I'm going to listen to what the government says. No, you can't do that. And you can't make that decision unless you're practicing it today. It's today is the day of salvation. It's the flesh. You know, we're, 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 we've been programmed to respond to our feelings, our emotions. That's how our minds are programmed. That's why Paul says you've got to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know, we, we, there's the world's mindset, and then there's the biblical mindset. This is the mind of God. We've got to put on the mind of God. But each one is tempted when he's carried away or enticed by his own lust. You know, it says, well, you know, the Bible says I shouldn't do this, but <laughs> here's a good illustration right here. I just just come up. A young guy sees this beautiful woman. He really is like, man. You know, his eyes and his body is responding to her beauty and her and her speech. You know, she's just this gorgeous creature. But she's not a Christian. She's got a different mindset than he does. Right? And the Word of God says, don't be unequally yoked. Well, if he hooks up with her, although she's very appealing, you know, being with her would be very satisfying. But the Word of God says, don't be unequally yoked. But he's enticed, he's lured by his own lust. You see that? God didn't do that. God said, don't do that. So you're carried away by your own lust. Oftentimes we want to blame the enemy. Well, the enemy may have set her out there, but it was your own lust that bit the apple. Then when lust has conceived, I've got a little lust in my heart, it's conceived, it gives birth to sin, I make a decision that's not based upon God's word. When a sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Death of joy. Death of peace. Death of satisfaction. And now you're in hell because this person has got a totally different mindset than you do. Double mind man is going to be unstable in all of his ways. I'm giving in here, but I'm trying to embrace God's word here. And then when I'm put in a position of decision, where's God leading me? And that death, you know, uh, death of joy, death of peace, death of... But that death is because you've separated yourself from God now. And he is life. He is peace. He is joy. Because you've refused. You've made a decision, I'm going to doubt, that is... Well, I know God's word says this, but man, I know what my flesh is saying here. And you give in to the flesh. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. Oh, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. This woman looks really, really good, the young man says. But you know that's not of God. So that's not a good thing. God's word determines what is good, what is evil, what is right, and what is wrong. He says every good thing given is from above. So when it comes in contradiction to what God's word says, don't be unequally yoked. You know that's not a good gift. You know that's not from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation shifting shadow. Do you hear that? There is no variation or shifting shadow. Sometimes we want to say, well, I'm kind of in gray area here. There's a gray area here. 
No, if you're in a light, there is no shadow. Well, there is a shadow, but it's on the, you know, it's not, it's, the, the gray area is only the areas that come in our minds. You know, there's going to be gray areas if I'm living in the spirit one moment and living in the flesh the next moment. There will be gray areas, but you've created those gray areas. When you're in light, you're not in darkness. The shifting shadows are only created by you. They're not from God. There is no variation or shift. There's right and there's wrong. There's right and there's wrong. There's good and there's evil. There's no in-between. It's either right or wrong. And the only way you can determine that is if you're in the Word of God, being obedient to the Word of God, living in the Spirit. And so when that phony comes along, there's not going to be a gray area. If you're used to handling truth, you can spot the lie easily. You're like a bank tailor. You know, bank tailor doesn't have to go to a school to determine, you know, if a bill is phony or not. You know, but why, why is that? Because they're handling the real deal all the time. And so when the phony comes in there, when the counterfeit comes in there, they can spot it immediately because it just doesn't feel right. And they know that's a phony. That's, that's what we're developing here in the Spirit. Sensitivity. So we can spot the phony. Peter knew there was a phony in Ananias. He knew there was a phony. He says, because Peter was used to handling the truth. He was living in the Spirit. And so when Ananias and Sapphira come up and, you know, with their, their phony uh, offering, he says, you're a liar. You're a liar. This is, this is not everything. You're not lying to me, Ananias. You're lying to God here. Verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. So it would be kind of a first fruit among his creatures. The word of truth. In the exercise of his will. God wants us to know truth. It's the word of truth. And Jesus being the word that became flesh. The word of truth. The exercise of his will. The exor- his will is for us to have eternal life. To, to be in his presence. And, the, and, and, and Jesus comes forth and, and displays the love of God, dies for, for man, and then he's resurrected. He's the first fruit of the resurrection, but we're also a kind of first fruits as we're resurrected in him. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to start. Oh, I've got to learn this still. I still haven't learned this. <laughs> quick to hear, slow to speak. And slow to anger. I'm not a really angry person. I, I've never been one that maybe Tammy knows differently or something. But I've always been able to control anger. But my mouth, my mouth, it just shut up sometimes. Sometimes you just got to shut up, you know. But be quick to hear. Listen. Be quick to hear. And the whole idea of hearing is more, you know, we hear audibly, but this is more, be quick to listen, be more accurate translation, because hearing is just, you know, the uh, the physical part, the audible sound. The listening, be quick to listen. You hear the audible sound, you apply meaning to that audible sound, and then then you apply it. And that's what he's saying, be quick to hear. Be be quick to hear what's actually being said. Now, Now, the only way you can truly be quick to hear and that's what James is driving at here. Uh, the only way to be quick to hear is being by, by being obedient to the Spirit and by being in the Word. And then when something is spoken, you can hear it. You can understand, you see. And then if you're, if you're quick to hear, slow to speak, because it's better to be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt, you see. It's better to just keep your mouth shut. shut. Be, but... We talk too much, and when we talk, we create problems. You know, someone hurts your feelings, and bam, you respond, right? Um, that's what James says. And, and, and all this, you know, when we get into the, the, the healing, when we talk about, uh, 
well, we won't go there either yet. Uh, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. The anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. So many things we do out of anger because we got our he feelings hurt, because someone's offended us. And, you know, what's in the righteousness of God is, is to bring forth people into, bring people into the family of God. And it's like Peter, you know, we're, we're quick to draw the sword. And he whacked off a person's ear. And when he whacked, you know, the ear, whacking off the ears, you got to have ears to hear. And because Christians are so quick with their sword, so quick in their response, they're cutting off ears and people cannot hear the good news of God. Because of us, we can't achieve the righteousness of God in our anger. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness, all that remains of wickedness and humility, receive the word implanted. Implanted. Receive it in your heart. It's got to become a part of your being. You know, I've done lots of marriage counseling over the years. And I set the couple down. I said, this is what you need to do according to the, words of God, the Word of God. And this is what you need to do according to the Word of God. And then a few weeks later, they come in. And, and then and it's like, I tried that and it didn't work. No, it's not something you try. It's something you put on. It's who you become. And, and it is receiving this, receiving that, and it's implanted. We've repented. That means... God's, the world says this, God's word says that. I'm going to reject what God, the words, the world says. I'm going to reject what my feelings, my emotions, and, and I'm going to reject that. I'm going to receive the word implanted in my mind. It's going to be called, become a part of the way I think. That's what it means to receive the word implanted. I used to think this way, but God's words has revealed this to me. I'm going to put this way, old way of thinking off and put on this new way of thinking. which is able to save your souls, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. And there's a lot of hearers who simply are deluding themselves. I can be in a church service and I can be teaching something and I can see all the heads nodding. Yeah, man, right on, right, yeah. And you see the heads nodding. They're in total agreement. And after service or maybe even a couple of days after service and I hear something that just totally contradicts what they were agreeing with. They're just deluding themselves. They're collecting information, but that information is of no value. The most important part about being here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, or Wednesday night is the application. Taking this word and planting it into our hearts, planting it in our lives. Because that's what saves our soul. It's the word. It's the word. Our souls are being redeemed. We say that our souls are being redeemed. Our souls are being transformed. We're being renewed in the spirit of our soul. Because the soul, heart, and mind it can be used interchangeably. Our souls are being transformed. The way we think. For he, for if anyone's a, a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, He's like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he's looked at himself, <laughs> I, I've got a good illustration here. It's good for me. You guys might be grossed out by it, but I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> for once he's looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person. He's, he's deluding himself. You know, we oftentimes take this and say, Tammy, this is what God's word says about be, you being a good wife. See what it says? It's not a reflector. It's a mirror. I'm not to take this and reflect it upon you. I'm to look into it and apply it to myself. It's a mirror. We're looking into it. We're seeing our own faults, our own failures, our own flaws. I'm not seeing Tammy's. I'm seeing mine. It's my faults, my flaws, my failures. 
And he says that it's kind of like you look in a mirror and you see your flaw and then you walk away and you forget what you just seen. You look in a mirror and you got this big old lamb's leg hanging out of your nose, right? You're looking at that and you say, wow, that's interesting. You don't wipe it away. You just, oh, well, that's interesting. You walk away and you forget that it's, it's there. It is gross because that's exactly what we're doing. God is showing us our filthiness, our ugliness. And we're saying, well, that's interesting. And we walk away. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, the law of freedom, We're freeing our souls from this world's hold. We're freeing our souls of fear, worry, anxiety. Because I put my faith totally in God. And I want to be transformed. I want my mind to be transformed. I put my faith totally in Him. I no longer have to worry what the world says. It's liberating. It's absolutely liberating. It's freeing. Because, you know, we're human beings, our tendency is to hang on. I can't lose my stuff. I can't lose this relationship. I can't lose my job. And we're worried and we say things we ought not to say because we're living in fear. But if God is in control, and if He's causing all things to work together for good for those who love Him, for those who's called according to His purposes, if everything is about the end result being joy, it's liberating. Is freeing. If anyone thinks himself to be a religious man, in religion, <laughs> I'm a very religious man. I follow the rules, rites, and rituals, and this, that, and the other. And the religions are focus upon self. I'm trying to make myself righteous. It's all about me. It's about me. I got to make myself righteous. I got to. I got to impress God. If I do this, that, or the other, God's going to love me even more. <laughs> no. Religion can do nothing for you. But James says, if, though, you want to practice religion, well, here's something you could do. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this. Visit orphans and widows in their distress. Stop worrying about yourself. Yes, you've been scattered abroad. You've lost everything. You're wanting more. It's but take your focus off yourself. Look at others who are in even greater need and help them meet, meet their need. And to keep oneself unstained by the world. You've got to keep your mind unstained. You know, the eye is the portal of the body. We've talked about this. But what's more speaking of is it's not what's coming in. It's what's in. And as you look out, faith changes how you see things. It's not what goes into the body that defiles a man. It's what's already in the man that defiles him. But he's saying, keep yourself unstained by the world. You know, I don't want to intentionally, um, how should I say this? Oh. All right. Let me go this direction instead. To keep yourself unstained by the world. It's, it's basically, he's saying the same thing he's already said. You got to trust in what God's word says and not what the world says. And if I'm going to keep myself unstained, I'm not going to doubt God's word. I'm going to be obedient to his word. I'm going to follow what his word says. Now, it can also mean keeping yourself unstained we were just talking a few minutes ago. If you're a drunkard, if you're an alcoholic, well, you don't want to walk into a bar. 
right? You don't want to stain yourself. So it can mean that in the physical. But primarily he's talking about the way we think, the way we look at, it, at things. That's where we'll land and uh, hopefully keep Glenn in prayer. Hopefully he'll get to feeling better and be here next Sunday night. Was that it? Did you guys learn? Did you, are you going to apply it? <laughs> That's the most important thing, right? Heavenly Father, we thank you for leading us and guiding us through your word tonight. I pray that your word's been heard, it's been understood, and it's been applied. May we though be those who look into your word, see those flaws in our own life, and, and deal with those, our ways of thinking, the ways we react, the way we speak, the way we walk and talk. Not that we want to be focused on ourselves, but we want to be obedient to how you're speaking to us. So may we be obedient, and may we be transformed in the renewing of our mind. It's in Jesus' name we pray.